In this lesson, we're going to explore nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and take a look at how to interpret C13 NMR spectra. Compared to many other forms of spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR, is rather complex. NMR relies on the magnetic properties of certain nuclei. Some nuclei have a nuclear spin, and because all nuclei are positively charged, that spin creates a magnetic moment. The technique of NMR requires that the analytes be placed in a powerful applied magnetic field called B0. Now within that applied B field, the orientations of the nuclear magnetic moments of all those nuclei become quantized into two possible states. Nuclei with their magnetic moments aligned with the applied B field are in a lower energy alpha spin state. And nuclei with their magnetic moments aligned against the applied B field are in a higher energy beta spin state. As you can see from this first equation, the energy difference between those spin states is proportional to the applied magnetic field. And because the energy and the frequency of electromagnetic radiation are linearly proportional, that means that the frequency of energy required to flip a nucleus from the alpha state to the beta state is also proportional to the applied magnetic field. And it turns out that radio frequencies are used to induce nuclear resonance, the flipping of nuclei from the alpha spin state to the beta spin state. An NMR spectrometer measures the frequencies of those resonances. NMR spectrometers are often referred to by their operating frequency, which is just the approximate RF frequency needed to flip a hydrogen nucleus from the alpha spin state to the beta spin state. Typical instruments have operating frequencies from 60 to over 1,000 megahertz. Now, all the nuclei in a molecule are surrounded by a cloud of electron density. And because electrons are moving charge, they create induced magnetic fields that shield nuclei from the applied magnetic field. Since all the nuclei in a molecule are shielded, chemists express differences in the level of shielding in terms of deshielding effects. And there are two forms of deshielding that can limit the extent of shielding each nucleus experiences. Inductive deshielding is caused by removal of electron density by nearby electronegative atoms. Anisotropic deshielding is caused by nearby pi bonds, usually double bonds. The variations in deshielding expose each nucleus to a different experienced magnetic field. And that means that nuclei in different chemical environments will have different resonance frequencies. The B field experienced by each nucleus will simply be the applied field minus the induced magnetic field created by the electrons in the local chemical environment. Each resonance in an NMR experiment is reported in terms of its chemical shift, represented as a lowercase delta. Chemical shift is a normalized frequency relative to the resonance frequency of a standard nucleus. The units for chemical shift are parts per million, or ppm. The terms upfield and downfield are used to refer to the relative positions of chemical shifts. Upfield resonances are lower in frequency and downfield resonances are higher in frequency. And note, that may seem backwards, but that's the convention. Now, there are several types of nuclei that can be investigated using NMR spectroscopy. One of the most useful techniques for organic chemists is C13 NMR. The most abundant carbon isotope is carbon-12, but it doesn't have a nuclear spin. The C13 isotope represents about 1% of carbon in nature, but it can be used in NMR because it does have a nuclear spin. A C13 NMR spectrum is a plot of all of the resonances for a given sample. And as you'll see, a C13 NMR spectrum can provide information about the number of unique carbon types in a molecule and a little bit of information about what types of carbon are present. So here I have an example of a typical C13 NMR spectrum. The horizontal axis represents the chemical shifts in ppm. And you can see that the range for carbon-13 NMR goes from about 0 to a little over 200. Note that the frequencies go up going to the left. So in other words, going left is downfield and going to the right is upfield. When I look at a C13 NMR spectrum, I like to break down the frequency axis into three separate ranges. Below about 50 ppm, we have carbons that are usually really generic, carbons that aren't really next to or near any electronegative atoms and aren't involved in any pi bonds. Between about 50 and 100 ppm, we have what I call the electronegative region. 
and here you'll see carbons that have single bonds to electronegative atoms. Frequencies above 100 ppm typically involve carbons that are involved in double bonds, so I like to call this the pi region. Knowing these three simple ranges can help you to quickly extract some information about the kinds of carbons you have in the molecule. A really important concept when studying NMR spectroscopy is the idea of chemical equivalence. When any set of nuclei can be related by symmetry like a mirror plane, or by exchange via free rotation, they're considered chemically equivalent. In other words, they're going to have the exact same chemical environment and experience the exact same amount of de-shielding. And that means that chemically equivalent nuclei will share a common resonance. So a C13 NMR spectrum won't tell you how many carbons are in a molecule. It will tell you how many unique carbons are in your molecule, unique with respect to chemical equivalence. So here I have some example structures that will help to demonstrate when nuclei are or are not chemically equivalent. So if you look at this first molecule, you can hopefully see that there are no mirror planes that can reflect one carbon to any other carbon. And similarly, there are no carbons that can be indistinguishably exchanged via free rotation. And that means that all five carbons in this molecule are chemically unique and will give rise to five separate resonances in the spectrum. Compare that to this next molecule. Hopefully you can see that there's a mirror plane going down the carbon-oxygen bond. And that mirror plane causes a reflection of the ethyl group on the left to the ethyl group on the right. The carbon on the mirror plane is unique. Moving outward from that carbon, we see two chemically equivalent carbons labeled B. Moving one atom further out in each direction, we again have two more chemically equivalent carbons labeled A. And that means that this molecule will show only three resonances in a C13 NMR spectrum. The next molecule actually has two mirror planes. One mirror plane bisects the carbon-carbon bond between the two alcohols, and that reflects the left half of the molecule to the right half. But a second perpendicular mirror plane now reflects the two methyl groups attached to each carbon. And that means that all four of those methyl group carbons are chemically equivalent. So this molecule would give rise to only two resonances in a C13 NMR spectrum. In the next example, we see a mirror plane going down the length of the molecule. Again, the three carbons that are in the mirror plane are all unique, but the two methyl carbons on the end are now reflected by that mirror plane, and that means they're chemically equivalent. So this molecule will show four resonances in a C13 NMR spectrum. The last molecule demonstrates chemical equivalence via free rotation. The carbon labeled C has three identical methyl groups attached to it. Those three methyl groups are interchangeable by free rotation along the carbon-oxygen bond. The other methyl group, labeled B, is unique from the others. There is no mirror plane reflecting carbon B to carbon A, and carbon B can't be interchanged for any other carbons via free rotation. So this molecule has three unique types of carbon and would show three resonances in a C13 spectrum. So let's take a look at a few C13 NMR spectra. Here we have one pentanol, and hopefully you can see that there are no mirror planes in this molecule. And there's no way that we can interchange one carbon for another via free rotation. So in this case, those five carbons are all chemically unique, and will show five resonances in the spectrum. And if you look, that's exactly what we see. Five peaks, five resonances, one for each unique type of carbon. Now, given what we know about the principles of NMR, we can actually assign specific carbons to each one of those five peaks. If you look at carbons A, B, C, and D, they're all very generic. None of those carbons are bonded to an electronegative atom, and none of those carbons are involved in pi bonds. So they're going to show up in that lower generic region below about 50 ppm. And if you look, that's exactly what we have. We see four resonances below 50 ppm. And because there are no pi bonds in this molecule and only one electronegative atom, that alcohol oxygen, the closer a carbon is to that electronegative oxygen, the more de-shielding it will experience. So carbon E, which is actually bonded directly to the oxygen, will fall in the electronegative region between 50 and 100 ppm. Carbon D, which is the next closest carbon to that electronegative atom, will have the next highest chemical shift, and then C, and then B, and then, of course, A, being the furthest away from that electronegative oxygen, will have the lowest frequency. 
In the next example, we have two pentene, an alkene. Now, there actually is a mirror plane in this molecule, but that mirror plane doesn't reflect any one carbon to any other carbon. The mirror plane is actually in the plane of the molecule. And again, there are, are no carbons that can be interconverted via free rotation. So once again, we have an example where all five carbons are going to be unique. And if we look at the spectrum, we do indeed see five unique resonances. Now, carbons D and E are involved in a double bond. That's going to place them into the pi region, above 100 ppm. Alkene carbons typically show up on the lower end of that range, between 100 and 150 ppm. The remaining three carbons are pretty generic. None of them are involved in pi bonds, and none of them are bonded to anything electronegative. They're going to show up in the generic region below about 50 ppm. Now, carbons B and C are each one bond removed from the alkene. And because they're closer to that alkene and its anisotropic deshielding effect, they're going to show up at a higher frequency than carbon A. If we look carefully, we can see that carbon B is bonded to three hydrogens and one carbon, whereas carbon C is bonded to two hydrogens and two carbons. Now, carbon is slightly more electronegative than hydrogen. And because carbon B is bonded only to one carbon, and carbon C is bonded to two carbons, it pushes carbon C to a slightly higher frequency. Notice that there are no resonances in the electronegative region between 50 and 100 ppm. That's because there are no carbons in this molecule that have a single bond to an electronegative atom. In our next example, we have an alkyne. And again, if you look closely, you can see that there are no mirror planes reflecting one carbon to another, and no carbons can be interchanged by free rotation. In this case, we can see that the two carbons in the triple bond actually show up kind of in the electronegative region. A simple way to remember that alkyne carbons show up in the electronegative region is that alkyne carbons are sp hybridized, and sp hybridized atoms are more electronegative than sp2 or sp3 atoms. Carbon F shows up at a slightly higher frequency because carbon F is bonded to two carbons, whereas carbon E is bonded to one carbon and one hydrogen. So the alkyne carbon bonded to two slightly more electronegative carbons will show up at a slightly higher frequency. The four generic carbons, A through D, all show up exactly where you would expect them given their relative position to the deshielding effects of those pi bonds. The next example demonstrates a substituted benzene ring. The benzene substructure is really common throughout organic chemistry, and it's simply a six carbon ring with alternating double bonds. If you look closely at this molecule, the only mirror plane that exists is actually the plane of the molecule itself. And that means that there are no mirror planes that can reflect any one carbon to another. And once again, there are no carbons that can be interconverted by simple free rotation. And that means that the seven carbons in this molecule are all unique and will give rise to seven separate resonances. So here, six of the seven carbons are actually involved in pi bonds. So we should see six carbons showing up in the pi region of our spectrum. And that's exactly what we see. The seventh carbon is really just sort of a generic carbon attached to the benzene ring. So it should show up below about 50 ppm in that generic region. If we look at the six carbons in the benzene ring, we can see that carbon G is bonded to a rather electronegative chlorine atom, and that's going to pull it downfield to a higher frequency. The remaining four resonances in the pi region are all pretty similar, and assigning these peaks to specific carbons is beyond the scope of what we're going to try to do here. In our next example, we have a carbonyl compound, specifically a ketone. Again, here there are no mirror planes reflecting one carbon to another, and there are no free rotations that can interconvert carbons to make them chemically equivalent. So here again, we're going to see four unique resonances for the four unique carbons. Looking at the structure, we can see that carbon D is a carbonyl carbon. It's involved in a pi bond, so it's going to have that anisotropic D shielding, but it's also bonded to an electronegative oxygen. And what that does is it pushes this carbon extremely downfield into the highest parts of that pi region. Carbonyl carbons typically show up well over 150 ppm. The remaining three carbons are all fairly generic, with carbons B and C being adjacent to that carbonyl, pulling them to a slightly higher frequency compared to carbon A. Carbon C shows up at a slightly higher frequency compared to carbon B, because carbon C is bonded to two carbons, and carbon B is only bonded to one carbon. 
and more bonds to that slightly more electronegative carbon will shift it downfield. In our last example, we have an ether. And in this case, we actually have some chemically equivalent carbons. While this molecule has five carbons, it only has three unique types of carbon. And that's because the carbons labeled A are all interconvertible by free rotation along the carbon-oxygen single bond. And that means that those three carbons will show up as one single resonance. We can see that carbons B and C are both bonded to that electronegative oxygen, pulling them into the electronegative region. Carbon C, which has three bonds to carbon, will be pulled slightly higher up in frequency relative to carbon B, which is bonded to three less electronegative hydrogen atoms. And then lastly, the three equivalent A methyl carbons, which are all chemically equivalent and will give rise to one single resonance in that generic region below 50 ppm. So here I have a small table representing some ranges for typical C13 resonances that you should be familiar with. In the pi region, on the lower part of the pi region, we have our carbons that are involved to double bonds to other carbons, alkene carbons and benzene carbons. At the high extreme range of the pi region, we have our carbonyl carbons. In the electronegative region, we have carbon atoms that are single bonded to electronegative atoms like chlorine and oxygen, but we also have the sp carbons of an alkyne. And lastly, we have the generic region, which typically shows carbons that are bonded to just carbons and hydrogens. At the very low end of this region, this is where carbon bonded to silicon shows up. And I mention this because the carbon bonded to silicon in a specific compound, tetramethylsilane, is what's often used as the reference standard to define chemical shift. If you remember, a chemical shift was actually the difference in the frequency of the resonance of a peak relative to a standard, and tetramethylsilane is the standard. It's used as the standard because not much shows up below that, so it makes it a convenient zero point.